That's only part of the cost. What about the direct costs? Police, prisons, jails, courts, prosecutors, defense attorneys, uh, and the lost uh, productivity by the item. Uh, it's almost impossible to try to figure out the total cost of the drug war. It's billions upon billions of dollars. <coughs> it was Carl Sagan used to talk about billions and billions of stars. This is billions and billions of dollars. It's incalculable how much the drug war has cost us over the years. So by any cost-benefit analysis, and the benefit is hard to see, but the cost is overwhelming. But if you don't buy any of those arguments, if you don't think the pragmatic argument matters, or if you think there has been some good done by the drug laws, uh, if you think that the costs aren't that great, that I'm exaggerating, uh, that, and that everything's just working fine, and there's no violence associated with the war on drugs, if, you, if you're delusional enough to think all of that, that's fine. But I have a final argument for you that the drug war is, in fact, immoral and counter uh, to ordered liberty. <laughs> the proper function of government is to protect people's rights. So when you have, and when, when we're talking about rights, we're talking about rights to life, liberty, and property. So the laws, criminal laws, that we enforce and that are in place ought to have as their sole as their sole object, the protection of those rights, not the violation of those rights. What rights are violated when individuals consume a drug of their choice, trade a drug of their choice with somebody else for money? What rights are violated? What victim is there in that situation? When you have a vi rights violation, there's always a victim victim of the assault, the victim of the murder, the person who was swindled, the person who's, uh, who's uh, suffered economically, etc. When you see a law where you cannot identify the victim, then ask yourself, is there any rights violation going on? Who's been harmed by this activity, whatever it is? And the essence of the drug laws, and the drug laws, of course, go to all the way from interdiction to production, transportation, and sale, and all of that. But the essence of the drug laws is the criminalization of possession of an object. You've got an object in your hand, whatever it is, whether it's marijuana, methamphetamine, heroin, whatever it is, you have an object. Just like somebody else might have a different object, a book that has words in it that some people don't like, or a photograph, a photograph of something that people think you shouldn't be looking at, or a weapon uh, that you have, that you, for whatever purposes, you own and possess. What do all these things have in common? They're of their possession of an object, and they're criminalized in many circumstances, and there's no victim and no violation of rights. It hasn't happened. Mere possession of an object, I maintain, this is my personal view, can never be a rights violation because you haven't harmed anyone else or threatened to harm anyone else. And I draw a distinction, of course, where people load the gun and shoot past your head. That's, that's an assault. I got that. I'm just talking about mere possession. And that's what's happening with drugs. Now people say, well, wait a minute. There is a victim here, and something has gone wrong. But it's not mere possession. It's use. All right. Well, first of all, the law is criminalized possession. But we'll forget that. We'll say that it's only use to their after. But who is using it? The individual who is taking responsibility for the use of that drug. <laughs> is it helpful or harmful or neutral to that person? All of these things that you're always thinking about, put your sweater on. You're always thinking about what to do for that child because in your role as a parent. Somehow, along the way, we ended up with a situation where people in power and government decided they're everybody's parent. And they're going to try to figure out what's good and bad for everyone, regardless of whether or not anyone's rights are violated. So we're going to have a regulation consuming about uh, how much fat can be in the hamburger served at the Armadillo Grill. That's coming. Uh, or uh, how fast you can drive, or what, and, or what, uh, what books you can read, or whether or not you should be wearing your sweater when it's 45 degrees. All of these kinds of things. There are people in government who believe that uh, seatbelt laws, etc., that the, that the government ought to be in the position of determining for you what's in your best interest. And that impulse to control you as if you're a child is, I think, the linchpin to understanding how the drug laws get passed. 
because people in Washington think, well, the political class believes, it takes as an article of faith, that all of the uh, Schedule I drugs are all harmful to everybody <coughs> in whatever dose is taken, and therefore, goes the logic, the, there ought to be a law uh, uh, prohibiting uh, the use of those drugs. Well, we've got to go beyond that, of course. We have to make sure that you don't get your grubby hands on those drugs. So therefore, we have to criminalize distribution. We have to criminalize sale. We have to criminalize manufacturing, transportation. We have to interdict from other countries to make sure that they don't get in here, etc. The entire fabric of the war on drugs comes from that, I believe, comes from that sim single impulse. They know better for you uh, what you should put in your body than you do. And starting from that premise, all these laws follow. All right. What kind of effects does all this have on the legal system? Sort of interesting, and, and I don't pretend to be an expert on this, although I've seen a lot of it. I w I'll tell you something tonight that probably you don't know about how the drug laws affect the legal system. And it happens hundreds of, literally hundreds of times a day in Arizona. And that's the effect that the drug laws have on the plea bargain system. You all know what plea bargains are. That's where someone is arrested for a crime, and they're charged with a crime, uh, and, and they weigh the risks of going to trial, where they might be found guilty or not guilty, against taking a plea that is pleading guilty to usually a lesser offense, and with some sort of either guarantee or recommendation that whatever their sentence is going to be is going to be much less, significantly less, than what happened if they were found guilty of trial. And this is a, this, these plea bargains happen hundreds and hundreds of times a day uh, in Arizona and thousands of times a day across the United States. In fact, I would wager without even knowing that the vast majority of people incarcerated in prisons across this country are there as a result of plea bargains rather than trials. Uh, and so, this is an integral part of our system. We can argue one way or the other whether this is a good idea, how it came about, etc. That's not tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is the war on drugs. So you might say, what's this got to do with drugs? And it has to do with low-level drug offenses. Yes, there are people who are arrested simply for drug offenses. But most people who are arrested for a drug offense actually were, were arrested while they were being investigated for something else, some other crime. So the typical crime, the typical felony that happens, if there's such a thing as a typical felony, in Maricopa County is someone is arrested while they were driving somebody else's car with a screwdriver in the ignition. Okay? And it's not their car, and they didn't have permission of the owner to have the car. And this is called, you call it car theft, we call it theft of means of transportation, which is a funny name for it, but that's what it is. Theft of means of transportation. It's a problem. And there are a great many of these arrests uh, on an ongoing basis in Maricopa County. What's this got to do with the drug law? When that arrest is made, the policemen search the individual, the uh, uh, soon-to-be defendant, the suspect, uh, at the point of, uh, of the, uh, where he's caught with the car, with the screwdriver in the ignition, or he's caught burglarizing a home, or with burglary tools, or whatever. Whatever the arrest was for, it was an assault after a bar fight, whatever it's, whatever's going on, there's a search that takes place, incident to that arrest. And when they search that individual, sometimes they find drugs. They find marijuana, they find a crack pipe, they find some residue, something. But what happens in that situation? Well, obviously the person is charged with the crime for which they're arrested, the theft of means transportation, the assault, the burglary, or whatever. But they also get charged for the possession of drugs or of drug paraphernalia. 